Welcome to my studio. I'm Del Rock Edwards, the clay guy. I make things out of clay, and I show other people how to do it too, because it's a lot of fun. I'm fixing to go inside and get busy. Why don't you come in and join me? Come on in. <laughs> okay, guys, guess what we're going to do today? We've done a lot of different things in the past here on the Clayrite Workshop. I know we've done fish and pots and other strange and exotic creatures, but today we're going to do the strangest creature of all. Over here to my left is a very rare and exotic bird called a dork. The father was a dove, the mother was a stork. That makes this a dork. Now, what's unusual about the dork, and they're indigenous to this state here in North Carolina, I think this is, the, this is on the flight path, is a dork wears stupid shoes year-round, sometimes open-toed sandals, and they'll have a pen in their mouth or a cigarette, and they wear cheap sunglasses. Now, in the past, we've done lots of things that were practical, and I don't know how practical it is to have a dork around your house, my wife says it's not that bad. We have to do several things that are different here than what we tradition do because we're doing something called mixed media. We do other materials other than the clay. Now you'll notice right off that it has a wooden base, it has metal legs, it has these small shoes, it has a clay body, and then of course we can add the uh, sunglasses or the pen in its mouth. And a lot of people that buy these from me in my studio will send me back photographs showing me what they've done with them. And they'll hang really gosh awful bad neckties around the neck or cheap jewelry or they will use them as hat racks. All right. The first thing we have to do, and here's my board over here on the right, step one, we have to make some decisions. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, the wooden base, I've already got a dork started just down below, and I've already made some decisions. So this is one that we'll be working with here in just a few minutes. And I've already got it started, and I'll show you what I've already done. I still have work left to do. I've started out with a wooden base. It stabilizes it so it won't fall over. Second, I had to pick a pair of shoes. Now, luckily, I do most of my shopping at a very exclusive store. You can tell by the bag, Goodwill. And I go in there, and I buy these old children's shoes. Here's a cute pair here that are open-toed sandals. And here's a pair over here that are neat little tennis shoes. Aren't those cute? All right. And I pick the shoes first. And I look around and I notice what are the dorks in my neighborhood wearing this season because I want it to be fashionable. And most of the dorks seem to wear open-toed sandals and cheap tennis shoes year-round. Okay, so I'll pick a pair of shoes. And in this case, I picked a pair of tennis shoes so I've already started. And the next thing I would do is I would decide on the legs. Step one, step two, step three. Now, for the leg material, you can use wood. And this is a simple wooden dowel, all right? This is a threaded rod, like you would put a nut and bolt and washer on. They're relatively expensive, inexpensive. And this is a pair, which I've already prepared. I use them quite often. This is a pair of rebar legs. I'll separate them. And that's what I traditionally use, all right? This has a smaller rebar leg over here. This one is slightly bigger. So I choose rebar because I'm cheap and I can get these free from construction sites. Friends of mine uh, get them for me, as well as your shoes, as far as that goes. You then take your trusty drill, and these come in standard sizes, quarter inch or three quarter inches, half inch. You use the same size drill bit, and you drill a hole into the wood. You drill it through the shoes, so in this situation, I would drill into the wood, and there would be my feet and my legs. All right? Now, once I reach that level, and I've done the whole lower part, and I'll just keep us up to speed over here. So I'll move over to the drawing board. Step one, you had to make some decisions. So you picked out the type of shoes that you wanted it to wear, ugly tennis shoes or whatever. And, of course, it's funnier when it's pigeon-toed. Okay, then you put it 
on a slab of wood, two by six, whatever, works just fine. Then you took the two rods and you drilled up so now you have the little shoes over there, the rods, and because of height, now you're ready to start with the body. So that was step one. Step two on the body, you put a little paper on the ends of your stick so the clay won't stick to it. Then we add the clay around the legs, and now we're ready for the body. Now, we'll come back over here. And what I've done on this one, I've reached it to that point, okay? I've drilled the wood, I put the rods in, I put paper around the top so they look like a drumstick, and then I made a round armature. We've done this every single show, doesn't it? We just take a plastic bag, like you see where the clay comes in right here, and then we cover that bag with clay, and that's the center body here. Now at that point, I was ready to start moving into the detail. Now every time I do one, you'll see one here, we'll get a close-up later, and there was another one over here behind me, so I might as well just be caught here in a flock of dorks right quick. I'm, I'm used to this, I'm always hanging out with a bunch of dork friends of mine. You see this guy, he's got different texture and different colors than the other one over here, and he's different from this one. So what I'm going to do now is move the one here on my left, and I'm going to start putting on the wings and the tail, soften it up some, and then we'll move up to the head. So it's pretty simple. We've got a good base, and we're ready to start the actual fun sculpting part. I'll move this guy back over here, and I hope he stays there. Dorks are bad about traveling. I've got him there. I'm going to start working with this guy here. Now, clay... When it's wet, like in the bag to my left, it's called wet. These are not very sophisticated terms. When it begins to be underlying and starts to dry, it moves in what's called a leather hard stage, which it makes it about the consistency of a bar of soap, all right? And that's about what this is. It's beginning to dry out because of all the air here in the studio, so I'm going to wet it down. When you work on a large project and you can't finish it, which was the case with this one. I started it in a class the other night. A, a bunch of uh, people wanted to make dorks, and this is one I started. You start that. If you don't finish it, you have to go in to dinner or, or go to your real day job or whatever. You can just cover it in a plastic bag that keeps it from drying out. And I've got several projects always going on in my studio. And next time, I'll let the camera come into the studio and see all the things inside. And when I decide which project I need to go back and work on, I just unwrap it, and the clay will stay workable literally for months. Now, as long as it's not fired in a kiln, and that finishes the process, as long as it's not fired, I can always kind of massage it back down and wet it here. And almost, when I use the word massage, I used it correctly, and I work the clay into the body. Now... A problem that we artists have that use clay to sculpt, when one layer or strata of clay doesn't totally infuse with the other, so they become one, like a woven rug, and they're in sheets, and they dry at different rates, sometimes air will come in and peel it off like your skin when you get a bad sunburn. So you want to make sure that it all works together. So what I'm going to do, and this is looking pretty good, I have a precarious balance here, and I don't have a tail on this guy. You'll notice on the one on the other side here, he just lost his sunglasses, he has a tail. So now, we always must go in sequence. You've got to do step one, step two, and then step three. That's why I used a board here behind me. I work with a lot of uh, young people that are very energetic and very excited, and they want to get to the fun part, like give it big bulgy eyes, and they want to jump over every part between A and Z and go to the end product. And of course, you can't do that. You have to do things in sequence, such as there's an old bad joke that guy said that my uh, wife kept trying to make me a birthday cake, but it didn't work out because the candles kept melting in the oven. And the joke was, you don't put the candles on until the cake comes out. Well, you can't do this until you do that, all right? 
Now, what I did here on the back was I scored up. I don't know if you can get close enough that you see my score marks, but I scored up, and what's going to happen is the new piece of clay will go down into those grooves and it'll give it a chance to hold on like a rock climber climbing a cliff face. Now, traditionally, I've always used white earthenware clay, but this time we're doing something different. The clay that I've prepared today was started out this life as white earthenware clay, but now it is paper clay. Now, paper clay is something new. It's only been around about a decade. And what it is is standard white earthenware clay with paper fiber added to it. Now, the beauty of this, the fiber of the paper gives it strength. And if you can imagine a wood chopper chopping wood, and you've seen him when he splits the wood for the fireplace, he hits it with his axe, and the wood easily cleaves in two, all right? Well, that would be a piece of solid wood. But if you were to take an axe and hit a piece of plywood that's been laminated and worked together, it wouldn't split in two, would it? Well, it's the same situation here. The fiber of the clay keeps it from splitting in two. Now, as usual, I comment on the fact that size matters, and everybody doing this will do it a little bit different. So it was really funny when there was a whole room full of us, and everybody was making a dork, and we, all of our dorks looked a little bit different. Some had shorter tails, some had longer tails. You even noticed a difference between the two that I have here. So I'm going to decide how long to make this tail. Now, I work with young people a lot, and it's a real joy for me, of course. And one of the things that I'm constantly overwhelmed with is they seem to be scared to make decisions. I might do this wrong. I might make a mistake, and then, ooh, I'll get a bad grade or something. And this is art. We don't think in terms of right and wrong or good and evil. We think in terms, do I like it? Would I like it better if it was longer? Would I like it better if it were shorter? So you must make decisions, and it's very good in helping people with their decision making. Okay, and the only person you have to please is yourself. Now you'll notice that I scored this edge also, and I'm wetting it down to create a slip. All right, now I must adhere these two surfaces together. Actually, it doesn't look too bad. Now I don't have a paddle. When I, uh, I can't have every possible tool that I might need with me. Most of the tools are very, very simple for people that work clay as opposed to working with stone or wood or bronze or something. Um, I have a wonderful uh, library of books, which is the first thing a serious artist does is begin to develop his library. And going to bookstores is one of my uh, favorite things to do and flea markets. I'm always looking for old books, and I have a wonderful bird book. It's quite old. It has lots of exotic birds in it, so when I, I look at it before I start to do a dork, and I'll take part of one bird and part of another bird, and I kind of add them together because I'm creating, which went back to my earlier point, I'm not doing a portrait of a particular bird. I am making this up as I go along, and the only person I have to please is myself. That is one of the beauties of art. The word aesthetic, I know, a classy kind of word, it means art for art's sake, just for the sake of art. It doesn't have a function. That would be utilitarian art. A pot like this with this uh, green man face on it, it can be storage for my tools over here but it also could have a live plant in it. So it's a utilitarian piece. I'm afraid a dork here is totally aesthetic. All right, now I've connected it on there, and the reason that I went like this and I patted it down was I'm actually burping it just like a small child. After they've had uh, their milk, you must pat them to get that air that's inside. We probably should do this to my grandfather after Thanksgiving dinner. I think he needs to be burped also. Now, I'm also putting a texture on here. Okay, looking pretty good, actually. 
Now I could tuck the tail in so it makes a nice S curve. See where it would tuck his tail in like that? I like that. Or I could shorten it. I could lengthen it. And this is what I'm belaboring. And I can't look up in a book and say, what's the correct spelling? What's the correct answer? I, as an artist, must take responsibility for my work, and I must decide how I want it. So I taught a couple of classes this morning. It's, come over here and help me make up my mind. Well, Sometimes people do need a little help making their mind up, but I try to make sure that you decide what you want to do. I decided I want that tail to be shortened. Hmm. Now I'm going to go ahead and put a little texture in the rear of the tail. However, you will notice the subtle cracks in the clay here. I love that texture. It is the natural texture of clay. I'm rather fond of that. Had a friend in art school that used to enhance that texture and make entire pots that had this wonderful look it, it was you know a thousand year old marble or something and I I'm very very fond of texture all righty I've decided to put a little bit more in and put the lines of feathers okay and I might change my mind and come back in just a few minutes that is the total beauty of this. Uh, one of the things I like when I'm working with children, the eyes go off when they find out I can change my mind. And I don't have to make mine look like everybody else's. I get a chance to express myself. And that's a, literally, I said a little light comes on. It's almost that dramatic. They quite often have a pretty smile on their face. And nobody can come up and tell me I did it wrong. All right. So this is kind of the, one of the joys that I have with art. Okay, I have textured that about as much as I wanted to. Now, at my studio, when I'm helping a lot of people, I'm constantly moving around the room, and I'll have the uh, added advantage of seeing my work from different directions. And it looks different when you look at things from different perspective. I've, quite often wish that uh, more politicians would learn to take a different perspective. I'm a, a bit of an art history uh, buff, and in the Second World War, as some of you may already know, Hitler was a, uh, a failed painter. He uh, tried to enter the academy in Vienna. He did some postcards and a few watercolors, and he did some street scenes, as they put it. You've, if you've ever traveled in all the European cities, there's always some artist uh, sitting on the uh, curbs and sidewalks doing paintings of the local buildings and cathedrals and whatever. Occasionally tourists will buy the paintings in hopes that this person will become famous. And not only was Hitler an amateur painter, so was Churchill, the leader of uh, England, okay? And so was Eisenhower who became our president later. All right, we got the tail on here. Now I'm going to put the wings. It's a similar situation that you saw earlier. Very simple to do. I'm going to cut a slab of clay using my wire tool. Those of you that are my regulars and have watched the Clayrite workshop, you know that the ideal thickness for clay is about the thickness of a slice of white bread. I did a workshop up in uh, Raleigh recently and a young man was in his uh, classroom and he made this and his clay was a little bit thick and I had said the thickness of a uh, slice of white bread and he looked down at his and he said how about Texas toast and I said okay that'll that'll work this was a little bit thicker all right you see this shape here I need two even shapes for wings so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this half in two that gives me two equal shapes now the reason that I did the tail first, and I mentioned that there was a sequence and there's a natural order to things. We know about slipping. We know about scoring. And if you're getting close, if you forget this, we'll know. Sometimes students will be dishonest with me and say, yeah, I scored, not a problem. You can fool me, but you can't fool the clay. It'll know. Now I'm gonna score here. I'm gonna put slip to both surfaces. And for those people that aren't used to uh, working with uh, glue, 
Glue works better traditionally if you put a thin coat on both surfaces instead of a lot on one surface. I wish I had a bra. Glue. Glue works better traditionally if you put a thin coat on both surfaces instead of a lot on one surface. I wish I had a brought my, uh, oh, that looks pretty good. Got nice movement to it. Oh yeah, a little hitch in the giddy up there, working just fine. See the movement, I'll bring it around. See how that wing swerves nicely? Well, I got it there, and y'all guys can see it. If I don't turn this guy right over in my face, I'll go ahead and put the grooves in for the wings. All righty? Looking good. Now, if I would listen to myself and follow my own advice, how silly can that be? I would have done this. There we go. If I wet it first, the water will be a lubricant. All right, that works good. Can you guys see that? All right. Now the symmetry, I have to do the other side. Now the beauty of it is it doesn't have to be exactly the same. You know, we stand at different angles and Animal Kingdom does the same thing. The stork is a fascinating animal. It's mentioned in the Bible numerous times. Matter of fact, the word in Hebrew means gentle, the gentle bird here. Look, good thing my dyslexia is working again. I scored the wrong side. Storks are, uh, storks are monogamous. They mate for life, which is kind of neat. They're extremely attentive to their young. And they're the gentle giants. They don't have the uh, vocal cords, so they don't do the singing or the uh, loud noises that some birds are famous for clucking and what have you. They can make a clicking, clattering sound, but that's about it. Another reason that I like them. Okay, quiet animal. They're also, again, it's biblical, but they're one in Leviticus, they're one of the unclean animals. You're not supposed to eat them, which I think storks are happy about that. Okay. They in Europe, they travel from Europe to Africa, and they come back to the same house every year, usually in Holland, and they will perch on the same chimney, which works out fine because uh, they end up with a heated kind of room. Okay, now you see the wings. What I'm going to do on the head is I'm going to make it from down below and then add it on, depending on how much time that I have. So I'll make it here in my hand so y'all can see it better and I don't have to reach up so high. All right, here it comes. I roll the coil that's going to be the head and I'm going to put it on, all right? I bend it over and that ends up making the ball that I'm going to build the face off of. Do you see? Okay, now this is relatively simple. Here comes the beak. I use my hands back and forth, put it down, the water, and I just add the beak on. How are we looking? Okay. Actually, not too bad. Okay? Now, I usually make the mouth big so you can stick a pin. I have known people to stick cigarettes in their mouth because they say a lot of dorks smoke, but. I wouldn't do that here on television. That would be wrong. All right, nice beak. Now, I tend to make an eye socket. So I put my finger in and I press up. I have an eye socket. Now I'll do the other side. The eye socket. Now you'll notice, I've got my working vest home. My favorite tool is a pin. So I'm going to work a little bit here. Here comes the mouth. See that's going to hold the pin? And I'll do the other side. Okay. And here come the nostrils. All right. I'm going to move it ahead of you guys. Put it up here. See how it's looking? Okay. Not too bad. Now it would be the eyes. I use another pen to help me out here. I'll see if this will work for us. Let's 
Let's see if you guys can see that. Okay. Now all I have to do is add the eyes. We know this trick. We roll a ball, tear it in two so we have two equal eyes. We put water in, put the eyes into the eye sockets. Now I'm really getting close on time, one of my favorite tools again. And I only have a few minutes left. So if you'll kind of go up to the top of the head here, you'll see where we're going to mount this head. I can't quite do it now. I would be pushing my luck. All right. Is he a dork? Okay. This guy does look pretty dorky. All right. Let me go back one more time and do a quick review for you guys. All righty. Number one, we made our decisions and got our platform, our shoes, and our legs. Then we built the body where the legs went in. They're running off the table this way. We added the tail down. All right. We brought the head up. We added the ball the beak, the eyes, and if I get time now, as we're running out of time, I'm going to play around with the details of the waddle here and the comb on top, and maybe some more texture through the body. Step one, make your decisions and get your materials together. Step two, drill your holes, put your shoes in. Step three, we'll build the body and put on the details. This is how you make a pigeon-toed door. Right, handy little item to have around the house to hold your hat or your sunglasses. And with what time we have left here, now that I'm working above my head, I'm going to work on this face. I'll turn him into profile, hopefully, so you guys can see him better. And we'll work him. Now, next week, we're going to do another exotic animal. And then next month, I'm going to show you the human body and we're going to work with a live model in here. Won't that be fun? You know, we could have had a live model this time if I could have found some dork friend of mine to come in here and pose. I can think of several dork friends that if I'd have asked, I think they would have done it. Okay? There we go. Oh, I like this. Now, the comb up here on the top is the most important part because that's where you can hang the uh, sunglasses. Okay? So as you guys are paying attention, it's interesting to find a nice piece of wood and you can have a dork at your house, all right? We'll see you next week, guys.